So hi everybody, this is Hustle Hub and Giacomo. And today I'm with Jordan Lambert. He's a CFA from, from Vequity. He's the managing director. And today we're going to talk about Cloudflare. So this is the first of two videos on Cloudflare. This is a more qualitative analysis where Cloudflare is. And the, the coming video it will be more quantitative. So a financial analysis after the earnings report. So without any further, Jordan, introduce yourself and let's get into the video. Thank you, Jacobo. Thanks for having me back on. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this Cloudflare uh, thesis overview is part of the cybersecurity series that we began in March. Um, so the, the first presentation, go, go and check it out in the playlist, was uh, to just lay the landscape of cybersecurity in the coming quarters. Um, we talk about potential consolidation in the market and how uh, leading public names can can benefit from this. And, yeah. and then in you sub can also, subsequent, you can also access the DCFs that Jordan has made in the first video, and I will link it link it in the description. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and in the subsequent um, presentations that we shoot, we're shooting with Hustle Hub is um, to to just dive into specific stocks and companies. So uh, that's uh, and this is uh, the first one of that. So um, right, without further ado, yeah, we'll um, we'll begin. Firstly, for viewers, this is a disclaimer. Uh, please, please give it a quick read. Right. So, um, at a high level, the thesis, the long-term thesis for Cloudflare, is that they have become or are becoming the only viable alternative to the hyperscalers. Um, and that is because to the hyperscalers uh, that provide cloud computing, uh, basically it consists of four pillars, which is compute itself, the networking, the security, and the storage. Um, and Cloudflare is the only one that has now emerged uh, outside of the hyperscale realm, realm that can provide all these four pillars of cloud computing. Um, and well, and also do this at a mass scale. So this is uh, at high level, this is what the long-term thesis is about. So we're gonna dive into each one of these. Um, Cloudflare's key advantage against the hyperscale is its highly performant global network. Um, that is going to benefit from the following secular technological trends. Um, so multi-cloud here. So um, enterprises now um, don't want to be just locked into using one hyperscaler. Yeah, they want to keep their options open for cost benefits and also um, different clouds, different public clouds have strengths and weaknesses. So enterprises are finding that they want to select individual clouds for best of breed solutions and features um, and just keep their options open. So this uh, multi-cloud trend is, is, is going to benefit Cloudflare because what Cloudflare can do with its global performance network is kind of be the connective glue between these multiple clouds. So they can uh, speed up networking performance as data transfers from one cloud to the next. Um, the hybrid, theme is also going to benefit Cloudflare because indeed enterprises are shifting more and more workloads to the cloud, uh, but we also still need to manage their on-prem data centers. That isn't going to go away despite what many people uh, may think about that. Uh, there's some enterprises that are in industries that are highly regulated like financial, uh, healthcare, and therefore they are limited in uh, what can be transferred to the cloud. And there's other enterprises that are less regulated, but they don't need to move everything to the cloud. Like, for instance, an, an accounting system or an HR system doesn't need to be highly scalable. So um, it would make more sense to just keep hosting that on-prem. So this, this hybrid um, environment of enterprises is going to help Cloudflare. And um, again, because it can be that connected glue and it can, um, it can it has the ability to provide converged networking and security off-prem uh, to bring benefits like cost reduction simplification and increase um, performance yeah um, you were talking edge, about you were talking about this in one of the previous videos when you were talking about 
the fact that if you go for the best of breed for every single uh, thing you, you need to cover, you might um, weaken the overall security. So you better off go with, with just one vendor, right? Absolutely, yeah. So it's a, a consolidation play as well. Um, having hybrid environments um, inescapably means that enterprises currently have multiple different vendors that they're having to manage for networking and security. So Cloudflare can do it all. So um, offsetting much of the, the latency, uh, associated latency and driving uh, network performance. Um, Edge Compute is another massive tailwind for Cloudflare because as consumers, we are increasingly demanding better online experiences, you know, websites that are more interactive, you know, uh, more uh, impressive graphics, um, stunning visuals, and also personalization as well. You know, we, and, and in order to deliver all that, like the, the visuals, the design, the interactivity, the personalization at scale, you need edge compute. And Cloudflare is the best, best player in this edge compute space because they have uh, over 250 points of presence scattered across the globe. So um, they can always be hosting an application very close, in close proximity to the user. Um, and also just more data is, is very simplistically, more data is, uh, it, it will be an impediment to some players in networking and cybersecurity because it's going to put more pressure on their networks. But because Cloudflare has this superior uh, performance network, uh, the growth in, more, in, in data, whether it's volume, the velocity, uh, the variety of data is going to serve Cloudflare very, very well. In fact, they've, um, they are, they've been chosen by OpenAI, uh, chat GPT, uh, to be the um, networking and security vendor for, for them. Uh, so they're you know, pre pre protecting the website, accelerating the website's performance. Um, so yeah, these are the, the key tailwinds um, in which they can have an edge over the hyperscalers and other players in networking and security. Uh, this is a slide just to put it into perspective how big this market is, uh, cloud infrastructure. So it's well in excess of $200 billion. Um, AWS is clear leader, followed by Azure. Um, I'm not saying this is Cloudflare's total addressable market, but if they can eat just a little bit of a market share of these uh, hyperscalers, um, then yeah, they've got a very durable uh, runway of growth. Okay. So um, when I do these presentations, I do like to provide a, a historical perspective in order to, for viewers to build up more knowledge about the company. Um, and having an historical perspective may help viewers appreciate the high entry barriers that Cloudflare has established for itself. Um, so it, it was founded in 2010. I believe it was 2010, it might be 2009. Don't quote me on this, uh, that might be a mistake. But anyway, they began life as a content delivery network, um, basically accelerating the performance of websites. Uh, so for people that are not familiar with what a content delivery network is, uh, Cloudflare, has uh, pops, points of presence um, scattered around the globe. And when a user makes a request to a website, instead of that request going to be the original server that might be far away, Cloudflare will intercept that request, have already have the website's content cached on its servers, and then can send the response really, really quickly back to the user. Um, so, with aggressive expansion, um, leveraging software-defined networking, uh, Cloudflare quickly built up a very dense global network, as you can see in the, the, the second map. So the reason they was able to do this was they was one of the early pioneers or a bit users of software-defined networking on a mass scale, whereby Software is decoupled from the hardware, you know, utilizing virtualization. And they did it in such a way that 
um, Cloud Player could apply the software of their uh, networking and security services um, to to any kind of uh, inexpensive commodity hardware. They, they, they didn't need to buy expensive networking gear, specialized uh, networking gear for each one of its data centers, which would have involved a lot of uh, high amounts of capex and been slow to expand. They thought, right, okay, we're going to use a software defined approach, use our software and put uh, put it on top of commodity hardware, uh, very inexpensive and scale very quickly. And that's, that's how they did it. So at this point, uh, Cloudflare had the networking component of a com cloud computing stack. And then in 2017, Cloudflare launched Workers, which um, is their computing platform, their, their platform which enables developers to build and host applications uh, in a distributed manner across the globe. So to do this, it converted each point of presence into an infrastructure as a service edge compute location for developers. Um, and yeah, this has become very, very popular. Um, now there's, last time I checked, it was last year, there was over half a million developers that had to use the workers platform. And I think it's pretty close to 1 million now. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, so at this point, Cloudflare already had the networking uh, pillar of cloud computing and they also, added the, the compute pillar as well. In 2020, Cloudflare entered the enterprise networking, uh, network security market, <clears throat> uh, promoting itself as a, a secure access service edge provider. So <clears throat> we'll, di we'll dive into this in a bit more detail in, in the following slides. Um, but SASE, is, as it's pronounced, is hugely important in network security at the moment, since the castle and moat architecture of enterprise uh, networks, uh, networking has been disintegrated. And SASE has uh, come to emerge as the uh, replacement for that. So at this point, Cloudflare had the networking, the compute, and the security components of the cloud computing stack. And finally, um, firstly, in 2021, uh, Cloudflare introduced Durable Objects, which is an object storage platform. And this was a big move for helping developers better coordinate state across distributed applications. Now, this has long been a problem uh, for developers because they want to use edge compute because they want to host their application in a distributed manner all you know across as many parts as possible right across the globe as, as they do with Cloudflare's workers platform. But there's a problem in, in managing the state. Um, so, so for example, say a user of a web-based application upgrades their subscription, for example, um, they'll do that with one, one individual server. So then that, that individual server will, will know the change in state but how can it communicate that, that change in state to all the other servers across the world that are hosting that application? You know, so it's um, uh, maybe another example might be uh, working on uh, collaborating on an online document with yourself and some employees. You know, the, you, the updates need to be instantaneous. So if you make an update to the document, uh, somebody else in a, a remote faraway location to you can see the update instantaneously. <clears throat> this has long been a problem uh, for developers wanting to have their applications uh, uh, truly distributed. So uh, a durable objects is a solution to make sure that the state is consistent right across all servers hosting an application. Um, in 2022, Cloudflare added another storage facility called R2 Storage. And this service gives developers object storage without the egress fees. Um, so what an egress fee is, is um, if it, for example, our enterprises at the moment, uh, typically if they're using the cloud, they'll use uh, AWS's S3 uh, as an object storage location. 
Um, S3 is highly scalable, very, very cheap and cost effective, and it can store structured and unstructured data. It's just somewhere where you can throw the data and decide what to do with it at a later date. So it's so very, very popular. But when um, an application is making a request to read any of that data, then there's a there's a, a, a data transfer tax, which is called an egress fee, because that data is coming out from the S3 location um, to, to the application, and there's a fee for that. There's even a fee if um, the data is moving between different S3 buckets within uh, the same location, this, you know, within the same region. There's still, uh, AWS will still charge a fee for that. So this is very, um, very costly for developers wanting to build applications, especially distributed applications that, you know, are highly dispersed. Um, so, Powerflare like introducing this, R2 storage, which is object storage similar to S3, but we're not charging for these fees, is a huge move for helping developers lower down their costs. And, you know, it's obviously still very immature, and uh, I wouldn't suspect it would be a full replacement of, of S3 anytime soon. You know, it would take a long, long time for that to ever happen, um, because S3 and AWS have so many... You know, hundreds of supporting services for S3 and it's very, very mature and reliable. But in the meantime, it can become uh, very, very useful for developers um, that, that need to lower down their cost and find out the optimum balance between using S3, other clouds and uh, Cloudflare's workers platform. So um, very, very good for driving down costs and in increasing performance as well. Uh, because ultimately the, the storage, uh, the R2 storage is get, usually going to be closer to the end user as well because Cloudflare uh, is more um, got better coverage across the globe. So now Cloudflare has all four pillars of the cloud computing stack. They have the networking, the compute, the security, and the storage. So this is um, yeah, this is what makes them now a viable alternative to the hyperscalers. So um, this is just a summary of that section. So Cloudflare is a leader in each of these four markets and has become the only viable alternative to the hyperscalers. So in networking, they're com comfortably the number one vendor for enterprise networking. You know, they, um, they, they just because of their global coverage um, or the protocol trickery that they do to accelerate performance, um, uh, they, they, they have something called a magic WAM, uh, uh, magic wide, uh, wide area network, which is, is something where enterprises can literally plug their network into Cloudflare's network and extend their actual corporate network as well it is their own. So this uh, provides a lot of security, a lot of uh, increased network performance. Um, and it's not, it's not really anything else, not really anything another vendor can do to emulate that at the moment. Um, compute would probably say the, the top four vendor, uh, you know, behind the, the hyperscalers on compute, but especially the, the number one vendor when it comes specifically to edge compute. Um, in regards to security, we're, we're going to dive into security a bit deeper in the next few slides, but we'd say the top five vendor for network security. And in regards to storage, um, it's a difficult one because storage is their newest pro product. Um, but for multi-cloud operations, they, they could emerge as the number one. Um, as I say, that R2 storage could be the connective glue where developers operating multi-cloud operations, applications hosted across different clouds, they can use R2 for a very, very cost-effective storage. And this is a slide taken from a previous Cloud Play Investor presentation. Um, just shows you how the total addressable market has expanded over time. Um, so kind of in the 2010s, they was just um, they were just kind of protecting web applications and also accelerating the performance of them. And then they added to that capability by allowing developers to build and host applications. Uh, on their on their network, 
Um, and then since then, they've, they've added um, Cloudflare Zero Trust Services, which is all kind of uh, security services, um, and also uh, improved their network services as well, which added um, about an 80 billion additional uh, mark, uh, TAM to their, to their business. Um, and then more recently, in 2022, they've added object storage, um, R2 and durable objects, which they anticipate adds a, an extra $100 billion to their town, which is only going to grow as well. So a huge total addressable market and Cloudflare at the moment, uh, I think they're trailing 12, 12 month revenue is around 1 billion. Um, so yeah, a, <laughs> very, very low penetration rates and a huge town to, to grow into. So uh, we want to now dive into the network security side of thing because this is part of the cybersecurity series. Um, so firstly, we're just going to explain the paradigm shift in network security. Um, go from there, explain why SASE is important, um, and then talk about the components of SASE and talk about Zscaler, who is a prominent leader in Cloudflare, which is an up and coming uh, best of breed player. Uh, and just kind of compare, compare the two. So in the last few years, network security has gone uh, undergone a huge paradigm shift. The old paradigm was the castle and moat. So as you can see here, um, apologies for the poor graphics. I know Giacomo, you said you'd help me on this, but I didn't take you up on the, uh, on the offer. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, we can see that you've got the castle, which has the headquarters and the data centers where IT operates. Um, you have the, the moat, um, which is the perimeter. Um, you, you, the green stick men are employees. Um, so most of them used to be inside the perimeter. Uh, you'd have the odd employee that worked remotely and they would be connected into the network by VPN. Um, the red stick men are, can represent any body on the internet or in another network, anybody basically who's outside of the, the corporate network. And if they wanted to connect to this corporate network, they would have to go through a firewall. Um, and also any of any of the green stick men that needed to enter out into the, the internet would have to go through the web gateway. Um, so this, this worked quite well because there wasn't many remote employees um, a few years ago. So uh, VPNs were, were not overloaded. However, in the last few years, um, we've, we've seen more and more workforces become distributed IT become distributed. And this was happening even before the pandemic, but obviously the pandemic and its ramifications uh, created a, a huge paradigm shift where there's actually more remote workers than workers in the office or in the corporate network. Um, so at the same time, workforces became distributed. As you can see, there's more and more green stick men on the outside of the perimeter, maybe working from home or uh, cafes or wherever. We've also had an increase in cloud usage, more and more applications hosted in AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Um, so it didn't make sense anymore to for any remote worker to connect with by VPN into the corporate network to then be back or back out to one of these clouds to access something like Salesforce or Workday or work, whatever SaaS application it might be. So this is essentially why the castle and moat disintegrated because it was no longer a perimeter um, if it couldn't defend the corporate network. So a new model emerged and this is SATI, which stands for Secure Access Service Edge. Um, so an attempt to make it way more simple to understand, and it is pretty simple to understand, is um, somebody working from home remotely Instead of connecting to an application in the cloud or a website on the internet, in, instead of having to traverse that connection to HQ or a data center in order to be checked by the firewall or, and the secure web gateway um, before reaching its destination, 
you know, which creates a lot of latency. Uh, they can just go straight out into the internet and go through a SATI cloud, which is a converged networking and security uh, stack that can form all these network and security functions and then send the user on the way to reach that application or that website. So a much simpler model, which um, increases the end user experience, obviously, because you're having a direct connection to these websites and SaaS applications, uh, but also it simplifies the administration um, of you know, managing networks and security. Because typically, I didn't show it in the previous diagram, but on that perimeter of that castle and moat, you've not just got the firewall, you've got the web gateway, you've got a load balancer, you've got um, the VPN, you've got you've got a router, you've got all these different appliances, separate appliances that IT have to manage. And it gets very, very complicated, uh, requires a lot of maintenance. Um, and so do opting for this way to moving that networking security stack off prem you know frees up um the administrators um a lot of time in order so that they can focus on more value creating aspects of their work um so simplification cost reductions there's lots of benefits so what exactly is secure access service edge pronounced as sassy well um Gartner created the term SASE, um, and then last year they shortened SASE to SSE. And they said SSE, which was just rem removal of the access, so Secure Service Edge, consisted of the secure web gateway, the zero trust network access, and a cloud access security broker. Now, apologies for users, uh, sorry for viewers for all these acronyms, but it really does save space using the acronyms instead of putting out the full name. So what a secure web gateway is, is um, an employee connected to, it might be a remote employee or somebody can, uh, actually connected to the corporate network on-prem and they want to connect to the, the internet. They want to go to a website, okay? What a secure web the gateway does is it will, um, filter for malicious websites um, and it will make sure that any malicious websites can't be reached. Um, and so it keeps a blacklist and whitelist of websites um, or unapproved and approved list of websites and only lets employees reach the approved website. Um, the zero trust network access is a, uh, is a connection where a, an employee needs to connect uh, usually a remote employee needs to connect to an application hosted internally. So the application is hosted in a, their company's own data center and the remote user needs to connect. So that's what Zero Trust Network access is. It's a direct, direct and secure access straight to the application, not the actual network. And what a cloud access security broker is, um, Basically, as a user, again, remote user or user on-prem needs to connect to a SaaS application in the cloud, what a CASB does is basically govern what that person can do in that SaaS application. You know, make sure that they're not uploading or downloading certain files or data, and, you know, they, they can only see and do what they're supposed to do, et cetera. So this is what SSE is. And then SASE is basically SSE plus SD-WAN, which is um, software-defined wide area network, which is um, a t uh, an intelligent routing system for networking. So it's, it can route traffic um, based on it is is a technology that is application aware and also understands the best paths uh, to send a, a, a user across the internet or across MPLS circuits. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a very very important for accelerating the performance and security of networks, especially in hybrid environments. 
So Zscaler quickly emerged as the number one leader throughout the pandemic. Um, and this was because they, they was the leader in the secure web gateway for, for many, many years. They but Gartner recognized them as the, the number one leader. And when the pandemic came along, the biggest, the biggest tool that enterprises needed was arguably the secure web gateway. Yeah, because we needed a cloud-based secure web gateway because everyone's working from home now and they probably use the internet more than anything else, you know, um, even more than SaaS applications or internal applications, they probably use the internet the most. So there was huge demand for a secure web gateway that wasn't on-prem, that was cloud-based and could directly connect remote users to the internet. And that's why Zscaler... Uh, emerged very, very popular, not just for a secure web gateway, but also to the broader SASE field as well. So, um, as I say, Gartner created the term SASE in 2019, and then in 2022, they shortened it down. Um, they, they wanted to separate the security and the networking aspects in order, I guess, I guess to make their content more digestible for their customers, because combining networking and security and trying to do a report on it might not be the easiest thing to uh, convey. So they se separated it. So SSD Magic Quadrant in 2022, um, Zscaler was, was the leader, as previously just mentioned. Um, but if it wasn't the kind of leader on the on the horizontal dimension, which is the, the vision dimension. So in terms of ability to execute, yes, Gartner thought there was number one, but before that, Netscope and McAfee Enterprise had uh, a better vision on, on where SSE will go in the future. Um, however, fast forward uh, 12 months, and now Zscaler has lost their, their prominent number one leadership in the SSE Magic Quadrant and been overtaken by Netscope. Because Netscope, uh, and we can do, we can do, shoot a video on that, Giacomo, about Netscope because okay. uh, a very, very exciting um, sassy uh, player that, you know, is uh, a very well-funded startup and may actually reach its IPO when the markets begin to recover a little bit. So it will be a very, very high-profile IPO. So we can shoot a video on that. Um, so, uh, but importantly, um, Cloudflare made an appearance as well. So you can see in the 2022 SSC Magic Quadrant, Cloudflare wasn't there, and then they appeared in, tw uh, in 2023, and that is because they acquired a CASB uh, solution uh, and incorporated that into their SASE stack. So there's... Here, we're just going to discuss four factors that will marginalize Zscaler's leadership in SSE and SASE. So the number one is Zscaler doesn't have the best secure web gateway capabilities despite being the leader. It doesn't actually have the most innovative capabilities here. Um, one reason, reason that Cloudflare in particular could eat away at some of Zscaler's secure web gateway capabilities is because of a DNS service 1.1.1.1, which provides an extra layer of security um, to users connecting to the internet. Um, and it's the fastest DNS in the world. So just to give you a bit of perspective, so a secure web gateway is, is employees on-prem or remote connected to the internet the secure web gateway, Zscaler secure web gateway, um, or Cloudflare secure web gateway will filter that those requests, only allow connections to approved safe websites um, and discard any requests to malicious websites. Um, however, for requests made to, to new websites, it, it needs to go to a DNS first, which is a do domain name server. And the DNS, domain name server will say, okay, uh, you want to go to example.com. Okay, right, 
I'm going to work with the other DNS servers. Uh, there's there's different ones at different levels and find out what the IP address is of example.com. And then they'll send, the DNS service will send the IP address, which is, you know, a bunch of numbers to you, uh, to your computer. And then that's when you connect through the secure web gateway and go to example.com. So Cloudflare has this 1.1.1.1 uh, DNS service, which is the fastest in the world. You know, it's processing tens of billions of requests every day. Um, and it has great DNA, great security built into this as well. So if you are making a request uh, to a potentially malicious website, then Cloudflare can stop that a lot earlier in that whole process of uh, connecting with the internet. Um, and it's not it's, it's not to say that you don't need a secure web gateway. You still need a secure web gateway because it's important to have layers of defense. Um, and there's situations where uh, if you've already visited a website before, you wouldn't need to go through the DNS because you already have the IP address. But this is just one example of additional services that Cloudflare can offer over Zscaler. Cloudflare also has a pioneering RBI, which stands for Remote Browser Isolation. Um, and this has a great chance to knock Zscaler off the number one spot in the secure web gateway submarket of SASE. And what a remote browser isolation is, is um, if you are uh, making a request to, to, to a website, to, to connect to a website, to get a web page, um, the server, web server will send back, you know, will respond with the web page. But instead of having that web page load in your browser, in your browser on your laptop, the, the web page will be rendered in a, in the cloud somewhere. And, and, and that rendered image will then be streamed pixel by pixel through to your, to your browser. And it just means that by doing that, you're executing the code uh, in a remote location away from the your browser. So any any code that is hiding in there that is malicious, it can be found out before it's sent to your browser. So really, this is the future of the secure web gateway, and it's a big part of SASE. The, and it's hugely important for those websites that can either be categorized as safe or risky, you know, those in between as those websites that don't have any reputation analyt analytics against. Uh, it's very useful to use this RBI because if you if you're a bit unsure, then you can just execute the code. If it's malicious, okay, we won't send it through. If it's not malicious, then stream the pixels through. But there's uh, because you're streaming pixels through, it can um, it can really impact the end user experience because it is it requires high bandwidth. Um, but Cloudflare has a pioneering solution to this, and they kind of make they, they execute it remotely, but have um, the actual web page render, render locally. And it's really pioneering. And all the other RBI vendors in this space are doing the execution of the code and the rendering remotely. Whereas what Cloudflare is doing is executing the code remotely, but having the page web page render locally on the client's machine. So, um, and that just yeah improves secure well doesn't improve security but it improves the end user experience so um yeah this bit I, I think that that could be quite key to uh, knocking Zscaler for number one top spot um the second point is Zscaler doesn't have a very advanced CASP um Netscope has a very very advanced cloud access security broker solution um which we've actually uh, shared a, a report on our substack is going to take a, take advantage of chat GPT because there's a chat GPT is great, but there's huge data security risk in using chat GPT because what employees are doing, they're using it in the workplace, but they're copying and transferring sensitive data into chat GPT. So a huge security risk. Only Netsco at, at the moment has the ability to to protect against that. Um, and this is very, very important for CAS being very important for SASE. Um, Zscaler also doesn't have a, the most performant global network. 
Um, Zizka is Jay Trowdry, the, C- the founder and CEO, would probably disagree with that comment. But uh, from our research, both Cloudflare and Netscope have way more performer global networks. Yeah. Um, and this is going to be hugely important as data volumes increase, as the variety of data increases, the velocity of data. Um, and especially zero trust, what we talked about earlier, zero trust, um, that requires continuous verification of, of someone's identity and it, it adds a lot of latency. So as more enterprises are using zero trust and increasing their usage of zero trust, it really, really is beneficial to have a, a very performant global network uh, that, that can offset that latency. And the fourth point here is Zscaler doesn't have an in-house SD1 solution, which is becoming very, very important because earlier in the earlier slide, we showed that SASE uh, is essentially security and networking. Yeah, you have the SSE and then you have the SD1. But players from both sides of the, the SASE market are, are consolidating, you know. There's some security names that have been acquiring SD1 vendors, and there have been some SD1 vendors acquiring the security the security capabilities. Um, so Zscaler really is the only one in that magic quadrant we just shown that in the leader section that doesn't have their own SD1. Um, and that is is going to be, I think that's going to be a big drawback in the coming in the coming years. Because having your own in-house SD1 provides a lot of synergies for a SASE player uh, because you, you're not having to rely on third-party integrations. It also helps the implementation for the customer as well. Um, so, yeah, it's not good news for Zscaler. Of course, unless they decide to acquire an SD1 startup. Any questions, Giacomo? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, one of the questions, um, <laughs> of course, is uh zscaler i want to mention that you were skeptical about the position of zscaler even before the gartner report i think yeah yeah absolutely and, yeah and the Z, the ceo of zscaler came one one a few days ago on cnbc he was talking about um he was more focused on delivering value rather than other players that are more focused more focused on pricing and customers generally love the value that Zscaler is delivering. Does he have a point and who was he taking shots at? Yeah, right. Um it, it may have been taking shots at the usual rival um Palo Alto networks potentially, maybe Netscope. Um, his, his comments are really interesting because Zscaler emerged as really, really successful in the SASE market, especially in 2020 when the pandemic fell on us, because they were very cheap. They was the cheapest. You know, they was competing on price. Um, and that's what, what saw their market share rise so quickly, you know. Um, so the in our opinion, the security has never been top notch, but they they did well because of their top down go to go to market strategy. Where uh, Jay Chaudhry, the CEO himself, um, building relationships with C level ex- executives, um, and then yeah, they just just having a very um, cost effective, um, low priced solution for SASE. Um but. But now um, things are changing because we're, we're seeing growth in data, you know, um, especially with chat GPT, which is going to be very, very uh, big on, on growing the amount of data flowing across these networks. Um, Zscaler seems to be having to increase its price now. It's increasing its prices, which is interesting. Um, and Chowdhury is claiming that others are increasing their prices as well, and, and, and maybe, but uh, we think that Zscaler is under pressure to increase their prices because they don't have the most performant network. You know, they're actually managing, uh, if you check on peeringdb.com, they have a number of independent ASNs, which is autonomous system networks, 
um, which is unusual for a global, you know, a, a company that has a global network. You wouldn't really have eight independent networks. You know, you you, you should one or two global networks if you check Cloudflare or uh, Netscope or a few others of the, you know, these companies that are very broad global networks. They won't have so many ASNs registered. Um, and I think this is because during the pandemic, um, they, they saw a huge demand for their, their SASE suite and they, they had to, been, you know, their, their existing ASM, their existing network wasn't uh, big enough. So then they, they had to add another one, and then another one, and now they have this mess of seemingly independent networks. Um, and maybe that is what is pushing Zscaler to increase prices, you know, especially with this, this, this growth in the volume of data and uh, the, again, the implementation of zero trust, which adds a lot of latency. All these factors is, is meaning that Zscaler, it, it's, its global network is, is not as performant as others and its costs are rising. And because of that, it's, going to, it's had to increase its price to compensate for that. That's, that's our take on it. And uh, yeah. If if you any any uh, viewers are interested, you obviously check they can check out our Substack, and we have a quite a bit of research on Substack, um, or they can become a you know a, a subscriber at convectivity.com where we talk about this more. Okay, okay, okay. The the second question that I have is more of a general question. So I think that a lot of people uh, lost focus on on the trend of uh, remote working. Last year, uh, a few names, namely Morgan Stanley, made headlines because they wanted uh, their workforce back. Where is remote work today? Is it something that is continuing, that is expanding, or are we going back? And do you think it will go back anytime? Yeah, well, um, I think it's, it is a, a hybrid again, isn't it? Um, I think we do, we're just going to go forward. Um, it, it's just it's just changed the mindset of um, employees, middle management, C level yeah. executives on changed the culture can, in yeah, companies, right? What can be achieved remotely? You don't necessarily need to be in the office, um, and it's just uh, in change of perspective on work life balance. Um, so I think going forward, you know, you you hear a lot of uh, people. Uh, joined a, a new company and they've, they've got two days remote, three days in the office or vice versa. Um, so I think this hybrid model is is here to stay now, um, even though don't necessarily, you know, pandemic, the worst of it is behind us. We, we don't need to be working remotely, but people realize that with the technology that we have, very, very much helped by cloud computing as SaaS applications, we don't really need to be in the office to do our work. So, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And the last question that I have is, in one of the previous videos we did together, you were talking about consolidation and you were talking specifically about Palo Alto and how Palo Alto could possibly benefit from this, maybe with acquisitions and buying smaller players, is it something that could work for Cloudflare as well? Could we see Cloudflare engaging into some acquisitions? Uh, yeah, well, was, yeah, yeah. Well, um, in the last, in the last um, twelve months, a bit over the last twelve months, they've made two key acquisitions. So they acquired uh, a, a Casp startup called Vetrix, which um, if it wasn't for that, they wouldn't be in this Gartner Magic Quadrant for SSE and uh, just released in, in April 2023. Um, so that, that was important. And Cloudflare always tends to buy the best of breed startups as well. That's, that's the difference between them and Zscaler. We've noticed that Zscaler makes acquisitions, but they try to go for subpar companies rather than like the best of breed. But that's just the just culture, you know. Um, but yeah, so Cloudflare acquired Vetrix, a best of breed, Caspi startup, and uh, then they acquired Area One, um, which is an email security 
startup. Um, it didn't catch a lot of attention because the company wasn't actually growing that much despite being a startup. But it has a very, very innovative way of stopping phishing attacks, you know. Um, so, and and personally, I think this this area one security acquisition and integration into the SASE stack could be a uh, key. Actually, we've got a few more slides, Jack, and um, that I discuss it in the later slides. Uh, everyone could be key for helping Cloudflare win more SASE business because uh, what everyone's security does is uh, it's, it's just very, very easy to implement, which is quite a contrast to SASE because generally SASE is a top down um, implementation. You know, you need C level, like, uh, uh, C level executives on board. And it requires a transformational process to a company's network. Um, and all these components, part of SASE is, you know, requires a, a degree of implementation. It can't just be done with a click of a finger. But with Area 1 security, it can be in um, email security. It can be implemented very, very easy. So this could be a, be a very good entry sale uh, to enterprises that may have kind of legacy email security vendors uh, currently installed, like maybe Proofpoint um, or Mimecast. Um, these, you know, to a degree are good email security vendors, uh, but we are missing a lot of these phishing attacks. What Area 1 security can do, um, it can just kind of be operate out of band, so it won't even interfere with the flow of email. So that's why it's easy to implement. But it can just sit out of band at the side and kind of catch all these phishing attacks, all these email-based threats that have been missed by these legacy vendors. You know, so it's just, you know, the ROI is very, very easy to see straight away. It's quick to implement. And uh, it could be a very, very good entry level sale for Cloudflare. Say, hey, we've got this area one. Uh, truth point might be missing 5% of your email base of threats, but we can guarantee that our area one will catch every single one of them. Um, implement it, see what the ROI is. And if they like it, then that just gives them a great opportunity to get their foot in the door and then ex uh, land and expand with more sassy. So, uh, I think Area 1 is a very, very innovative email startup that uh, could really be instrumental for Cloudflare. So on to Cloudflare's advantages to help it become a future SASE winner. So we've probably discussed some of these already, but we'll just have a recap. So Cloudflare's global network is unrivaled in terms of coverage and performance, which gives it significant advantage in all aspects of SASE. Cloudflare is a leading SD1 and uh, is a leading SD1 vendor and also has other network acceleration tools to offset the added latency from Zero Trust and Cas B. Um, and and yeah, this 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 is important to know because this uh, is this global network is why OpenAI, uh, you know, with its Chat GPT um, web-based application, is is decided to choose Cloudflare because it has that uh, uh, application acceleration and protection capabilities. Um, Cloudflare's DNS and RBI will help it grow more secure web gateway business. Uh, currently, the CASB capabilities of Cloudflare are limited, but the roadmap of converging CASB with other solutions is, is quite promising. And email security, we've just spoke about that. It's not actually officially part of the SASE definition, first created by Gartner in 2019, but uh, we think it should be because as you can see on this diagram, there isn't email security included there. It's kind of been treated separately within the security stack, um, but really it, it, it is important. So we think area one security, which was acquired by Cloudflare last year is going to be very important for them winning more SASE business. Right, so we're comparing Cloudflare and Zscaler here, uh, but really it's a bunch of cybersecurity and software companies that we, we like to keep coverage on. Um, 
it's a scatter plot on the y axis you've got estimated next 12 month growth and on the x axis you've got the last 12 months enterprise value to gross profit multiple um, you can see the line of best fit. Any companies on that line of best fit, we would say they are probably fairly valued. The ones under the line of best fit are overvalued. The ones over the line of best fit are undervalued. So it's important for viewers to make that distinction. Um, I've just downloaded this from Coifin without kind of changing the axis to make it more intuitive. But yeah, so the ones under the line of best fit are the ones that are overvalued. So um, Snowflake, Cloudflare, um, um, Broadcom, Meta, we would say they, they are un overvalued at the moment. But Cloudflare is quite close to the line of best fit. Um, it does have a high multiple, but with the growth, and also it's high, uh, nearly 80% gross profit margin, you know, is you, you could put a case forward to, to arguing that it might be the fair value range. Um, Zscaler on our band is way above that line of best fit and looks quite attractive, but there might be a reason for, for this, you know, is um, so in the next slide, we're just going to make some further considerations about Zscaler and Cloudflare. Because on the face of it, if you're just going to judge it on this relative valuation, yeah, Zscaler looks more attractive. Um, maybe in the short term, it does look more attractive. But longer term, we think Cloudflare is like a, 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 good, a good company to hold and uh, just, just buy on the dip and just keep on building a position. Um, so, yeah, let's look at the uh, penultimate slide. So long term considerations for the SASE market. So SASE is a transformational technology stack which has been well suited to Zscaler's top-down go-to-market strategy. So mentioned earlier that it's not easy um, if you're if you're going to completely disintegrate that castle and moat architecture and uh, deploy SASE, then it is very trans transformational. So you need buy-in from C-level executives. Um, and Zscaler's top-down approach where you've got Jay Chaudhry being very uh, almost like evangelistic marketing where he's out on the road, he's in media a lot, is building relationships with executives. Um, and also they, they've developed the channel very, very well. So the channel is like your system integrators, your managed security uh, service providers. Um, these are the guys that will actually implement a Zscaler as a solution for the customer uh, and it, in some cases even operate it for them. So this top-down approach has been very, very good for Zscaler uh, and also being cheap as well. Um, Cloudflare has historically had a bottom-up go-to-market strategy um, because it didn't, its, it's origins aren't in network security, right? Its origins are in helping uh, developers protect applications, accelerate applications, and then build applications. So it was better suited to a bottom-up go-to-market strategy where they've got a huge uh, freemium tier where they, they, they can allow developers to access various uh, um, developer security and networking services for free of charge. Um, and then you know, uh, slowly but those developers expand, become more developers in one company, and then that company can become a paid customer. And because of this bottom-up strategy, they, they have a very uh, quick feedback loop where they can release products to a beta group of developers, uh, and then they will provide feedback, and then they can iterate on the product and improve yeah. the product. So this bottom go-to-market strategy has served it very, very well with small, medium-sized businesses and non-security markets. But in order to have a better success in the SASE market, we do all need to change the DNA slightly and have more of a top-down focus. So, um, but we think it's promising because Cloudflare only began targeting the enterprise segment um, in 2020. Um, and as Cloudflare gets better at the top down go to market, its security division should experience high durable growth. 
Uh, so uh, a parallel or previous um, company to compare this to is, is Fortinet. So Fortinet is a leading cybersecurity name, has very great presence in the enterprise segment at, at the moment, but it wasn't always the case. They started out in the SMB market and um, they quickly you know, expanded to have like over 400 of their, 400,000 of their appliances are installed across the world, mostly with small to medium sized businesses. Um, and then, you know, in the mid 2010s, uh, they decided to shift their focus to the enterprise segment, you know, uh, potential high growth and high margins. Well, it didn't happen overnight. It, it took, it probably took the best part of a decade for Fortinet to build a reputation in the enterprise segment. Um, so with that in mind, Cloudflare is, you know, it might take them a couple more years, but they will, I'm, I'm sure they will be able to do it. Uh, they have made... Uh, key leadership changes in their sales organization uh, in order to focus on the top down, build channel partnerships, etc. So um, if they are going to succeed, then investors should know that that's, that's some growth that is, is going to develop over time. Um, as SASE com competition heats up, Cloudflare's bottom-up DNA that has facilitated its high velocity of product releases or to help it compete more effectively than Zscaler, it was significantly slower releasing new features and solutions. So, yeah, we've talked about their bottom-up DNA kind of being a bit of a hindrance as they entered the network security segment, uh, but it can also be an advantage to them as well, because that bottom-up DNA has just uh, facilitated this high-velocity product release where they... You know, they don't have to put out a polished product um, like many uh, security vendors need to. They need to put out a polished product, right? Because it's very important that the product works straight away. Um, because Cloudflare has been in other segments of software, they've um, often put out products that haven't been perfectly polished, but then they quickly receive feedback from, from people who are using it and iterate quickly and improve the product. Um, so if SASE competition does heat up and it's a matter of like who can release the quickest features, you know, and keep keep their customers interested and engaged and wanting to, um, you know, stay with them on their roadmap, then this could be an advantage for Cloudflare. All right, so the conclusion, um, on a relative basis, Cloudflare is overvalued, um, positioned below the scatterplots line of best fit. From my DCF perspective, we also consider Cloudflare just outside the fair value range. Um, however, for us, we think it's a hold and buy the dip stock due to the company's talent, culture, leadership, and amazing opportunities ahead. Um, a, a key takeaway for investors um, to do their further research is just, just know that the company has a great chance of becoming like the super cloud or of the networking super cloud for multi-cloud operations. So that's, uh, you know, they, they have the potential to be, be huge. Detail wins are multi-cloud. We we spoke about that before. Um, vendors don't, uh, companies don't want to be locked into a single cloud provider. Um, and this leads, doing so, uh, having multiple clouds leads to complexity and high cost. Cloudflare can be instrumental for enterprises that want greater application networking performance with lower costs. So that R R2 storage is, is a key component there, as well as generally the, the density of their global network. Um, another key tailwind is the edge compute and storage. Um, so as developers are increasingly looking to host applications in a distributed manner across smaller pops, um, then Cloudflare's workers, durable objects, R2 storage are the best option for developers with this requirement. Um, and then as we've dived in quite deeply to SASE, if Cloudflare can become as effective at top down as they are at bottom up, then their presence in SASE will only grow. So yeah, that's that's the Cloudflare presentation concluded, Jack. So thank you, Jordan, for today. Make sure to like and subscribe for the coming analysis on um, Cloudflare's financials. 
that will come up next week. So make sure not to miss that out. Thank you, Jordan, for this presentation today and see you next time. Yeah, thank you, Jack. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.